Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The mass extinction that took place at the end of the Cretaceous period essentially wiped the slate clean for many animal groups. While the Mesozoic world had been dominated by archosaurian reptiles, most notably the dinosaurs and pterosaurs, the KPG extinction event led to the demise of this order, with all dinosaurs except for the birds dying out, while the flying pterosaurs vanished entirely. These unique, and at times bizarre animals, were the largest creatures ever to take to the skies, and by the late Cretaceous occupied a diverse array of ecological niches, ranging from terrestrial stalk-like predators to soaring ocean-going piscivores. With the great reptiles out of the way, both mammals and the previously rare modern bird group Neonithes exploded in terms of diversity during the Paleocene, moving into niches that were completely foreign to their Cretaceous ancestors. One of the most perplexing examples of this were the Pelagornithids, also known as the pseudo-tooth birds. Appearing shortly after the KPG extinction event, and probably evolving in the southern hemisphere, these birds moved into the vacated niches once occupied by the large soaring oceanic pterosaurs, such as Pteranodon and the Nyctosaurids, somewhat resembling modern albatrosses, with elongated narrow wings adapted for flying great distances over the open seas but with proportionally large skulls equipped with odd tooth-like structures running along the edge of the beak. These were not true teeth, like those of the more basal Ichthyornithian seabirds of the Cretaceous, as they did not grow in sockets and were not replaced throughout the animal's lifetime, although some recent studies have suggested that they may at least be homologous with true teeth on a molecular level. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the controversial nature of these animals, displaying a great deal of convergence with other groups of seabirds, such as hind limbs similar to those of modern albatrosses and petrels, beaks similar to the ichthyornithes, and elements of the wings and body being somewhat like that of pelicans, storks and tube noses. In addition, the structure of their pterygoid bones in the palate were similar to modern galloanserans, the chicken and duck-like birds. This has been the favoured position in recent years, with pelagornithids being considered to be basal relatives of the duck line and seriforms in particular. However, a 2022 paper described Janavis, an ichthyornithine with a pterygoid bone similar to that of galloanserans. This implies that a galloanseran-like pterygoid is ancestral for crown group birds as a whole, rather than a derived feature of neonaths. The authors noted that the pelagornithids may not be close relatives of ducks and fowl at all, but could instead represent an earlier diverging lineage outside of modern birds. Perhaps those similarities to ichthyornithines were more important than was once thought. Regardless of all this convergent evolution, pelagornithids rapidly became a very successful group and expanded in size to become the largest, although maybe not the heaviest, flying birds. Unlike modern albatrosses, which are restricted to relatively cool waters in the North Pacific and the Southern Ocean, Pelagornithids developed during the Paleocene and Eocene, when the Earth was much warmer than today, with their often fragmentary remains being found almost worldwide. However, the oldest and most basal members of this group so far known is the genus Prodontopteryx, from early Paleocene deposits in New Zealand, dated to roughly 62 million years ago. This was by far the smallest Pelagornithid, being about the size of modern gulls, and possessed short, broad pseudo-teeth well suited for grabbing fish. Later members of the group generally had more needle-like pseudo-teeth that were better at seizing soft-bodied prey like squid. Other early pelagornithids have been found from the northern hemisphere, but all of these are several million years younger than Prodontopteryx. The dubious genus Pseudodontornis is known from North America and Eurasia, while the already albatross-sized Odontopteryx related to the warm subtropical seas that covered much of modern Europe and North Africa, from the late Paleocene to the late Eocene, thriving for up to 16 million years. The early Eocene Dasornis was related to the UK and possibly elsewhere, possessing a wingspan of about 4 metres or 13 feet. Later Eocene fossil material belonging to similarly large pelagornithids have been recovered from Belgium, the Pacific coast of North America and Antarctica, although it is not certain if all of these belong to the same genus. Another large Eocene form, Gigantornis, was native to what is now Nigeria and was among the biggest pelagornithids, with a wingspan projected to be up to 6 metres or 20 feet. As with most pseudotooth birds, its remains are highly fragmentary due to the very lightweight and delicate nature of the bones. Like modern albatrosses, 
Pelagornithids would have spent most of their time at sea, utilising oceanic currents to cover great distances in search of prey. Fossil remains of juveniles have revealed that young pseudotooth birds were heavily reliant on their parents for probably at least the first year of their lives, with the adults being K-selected breeders that produced only a single chick at a time that required significant investment. This would also mean that pelagornithid numbers were never particularly high compared to other seabirds of the time, which may have eventually led to their downfall. In researching this group, I've also found that many listed genera are dubious, as they are represented by tiny scraps of bone, so there is very little to say about them. From the late Eocene onwards, Pelagornithids remained very large, with a successful Miocene genus Osteodontornis possessing the second longest wingspan of the group at at least 20 feet. It was present across the Pacific Ocean, with remains having been found both in Japan and the west coast of North America. When standing on the ground, this bird would have been about four feet tall and would have been an awkward clumsy walker due to its short stumpy hind limbs. It would have probably nested on high cliffs and plateaus, where it could simply catch the wind with its incredibly long wings to begin soaring. Its downturned pseudo teeth would have been effective at grabbing small slippery prey such as squid and other cephalopods that were either caught on the wing or from the surface while swimming. While doing this, Osteodontornis would have been vulnerable to marine predators, including toothed whales and a variety of sharks, including the enormous Otodus megalodon. This genus was long-lived, thriving from the early Miocene about 20 million years ago to the late Miocene about 6 million years ago, which is quite typical for pseudotooth birds. While Osteodontornis appears to have vanished by the end of the Miocene, Potential Pliocene and early Pleistocene age remains from Japan have been suggested to belong to this genus, but these require more study to prove this connection. The closely related genus Pelagornis was even larger and more successful, persisting from the late Oligocene to the early Pleistocene, an astonishing span of about 23 million years. Up to four species are known, which inhabited both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in the western United States, Europe and North Africa. The largest of these was P. Sandersi from the late Oligocene Chandler Bridge formation of South Carolina, living between 27 and 24 million years ago. The world was significantly warmer at this time, with the formation being home to a variety of coastal marine animals, including dugongs, seals, gavialid crocodilians, and a diversity of cetaceans and sharks. With a wingspan of over 7 meters and potentially up to 24 feet, P. Sandersi possessed the longest wingspan of any bird, being comparable to the extinct pterosaur Pteranodon in terms of size. This is notably longer than the up to 6.5 meter wingspan of Argentavis, the previous record holder, although this pteratorn may have still been the heavier animal. Feeding on cephalopods and effectively soaring over vast tracts of open ocean, Pelagornis may not have been able to flap its wings much at all, relying on updrafts and strong winds to assist in takeoff. Unlike the earlier pterosaurs, which were capable of more easily vaulting into the air from a standing start. While many genera of Pelagornithids were clearly successful animals, the group sadly died out by the early Pleistocene around 2.5 million years ago, with the last members of Pelagornis being contemporaries of the human species Homo habilis. The reason for the extinction of these mighty birds have been heavily debated by paleontologists, with it once being assumed that Pelagornithids perished due to competition with toothed cetaceans and pinnipeds. However, this is no longer thought to be the case, as pseudotooth birds lived alongside these animals for tens of millions of years with no apparent drop in diversity. Pinnipeds are also limited to near-shore environments, while Pelagornithids travelled widely over the open ocean. In addition, the breeding locations of these birds would have been remote and isolated from potential predators and competitors. It is much more likely that a variety of factors influenced the decline of Pelagornithids, with the main contributor being a change in global climate after the mid-Miocene climatic optimum, the gradual freezing of Antarctica, the closure of the Straits of Panama and the Mycenaean salinity crisis in the Mediterranean. In that respect, it may be significant that some lineages of cetaceans, like the primitive dolphins of the Kentriodontidae or the Squalodontids, flourished alongside the Pelagornithids and became extinct at about the same time. 
This is also when Autodus Megalodon vanishes from the fossil record, with the Pliocene signalling a shift to more familiar modern oceanic ecosystems, dominated by orcas, massive baleen whales and prosolarid seabirds. All of these animals and many others were able to exploit the end of the older, warmer Cenozoic era, while the pseudotoothed birds, with their large size and slow rate of reproduction, were unable to adapt and perished. They leave behind only fragmentary remains with a confusing array of features that are likely to puzzle paleontologists for many generations to come, and we can only imagine how majestic these soaring birds must have been. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the Permian Thoracophalians, so until then I'll see you again soon. Cheerio, 